Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for the invitation. And thanks to the organizers for this beautiful workshop. Uh, I'm going to try to set my meter. But anyway. Um, so, yeah, I will focus es essentially on the expected improvement, which is one uh, particular acquisition function for Bayesian optimization. But uh, we also review some variants of the EI, which are adapted for uh, different setups. So I start with something very smooth about global optimization, Bayesian global optimization. Then we'll continue with uh, the EI criterion, and I will, we will really sp take some time to construct and to understand the, the foundation of this criterion. And, and then finally, we'll review some, some further results in Bayesian global optimization. So the setup that we will have in the following is the one of uh, a deterministic function Sometimes it will be observed in noise, but the function is deterministic uh, from some subset of RD, typically compact, and uh, we assume that the function is continuous. Just for the vo vocab, uh, we call the global minimum of f, uh, f star. Um, and the points where this global minimum is reached uh, is denoted argmin of f. So this is a set. You might have several points where f star is reached, named the global minimizers. So we are doing minimization here. Of course, this is just a convention. Of course, as you know already, uh, global optimization appears in many real world applications. So an example, an example because the whole point of what we are doing here with Bayesian optimization is that it's impossible in many problems to work out analytically f star or the admin so if you take, for instance, uh, an objective function of that form and you use a classical method uh, like steepest descent uh, with a starting point here, then you will end up there at first uh, where minus the gradient of f gives you the initial search direction. And then you can find the next point by uh, considering, I mean, first you can define the direction, then you can find the next point, which is excuse me, actually here, uh, which you obtain by minimizing the function of a line here. And then you can continue like that iteratively. And actually, this algorithm is, not, uh, is known to be not so efficient uh, because it zigzags a lot. And there are many ways uh, you can improve that. But here, we, we want to make the convergence global in the first place. And also, uh, we will typically assume that the gradients are not available. So if you are in the gradient-based case and you want to make it global, you have several options. There are several global optimization algorithms that exist. One option that you could envisage is to take several starting points, run steepest descent or something more elaborated, and then take the best solution. In that case, by the way, uh, the function we are considering has three global optimizers, minimizers, uh, meaning that you can reach the same performance in three different locations in the input space. OK, so this, this is the kind of uh, approach which we will not consider here because of its drawbacks. It's very costly in terms of number of iterations. Uh, but actually, the fact that you know the derivatives is mitigating the cost. Uh, but also choosing the number of starting points is not trivial. So we would like to have some strategy which is der derivative free and where no explicit formula is available for f. And f is really expensive to evaluate. So in the family of derivative-free algorithms, you have many things uh, that include evolutionary strategies, genetic algorithms, simulated annealing, particle swarms. Probably there are some experts of that in the room. Uh, but they also suffer from some limitations, like the cost and also uh, the lack of theoretical guarantees in some cases. In some cases, you have very nice theorems that guarantees convergence and stuff. In some cases, it's more heuristic. So what we want to do now is to review this uh, GP-based optimization. I call it GRF. Those who were there yesterday know that there is some vocab uh, back and forth uh, between different communities. And we will try to adopt uh, a relatively mathematical and uh, uh, rigorous approach to this expected improvement thing 
and see how far we can go. So in Bayesian optimization, uh, typically, you see the, the, the function as one realization from some random mechanism. So some prior stochastic model. Here it will be a GP. The GP we denote it by Z. And we call it a Gaussian random field. And the typical steps uh, in uh, the algorithms we will tackle is first to evaluate the, the function f at a set of points. This is a topic in itself, like initial design. We will not go into detail on that. And then, uh, iteratively, to update the distribution of this stochastic model by conditioning on available evaluations, choose a, a next point or a next, some batch of next points, sometimes by maximizing some acquisition function or sampling criterion, and then uh, evaluate the function f and, and loop. So a little example. Uh, it's really a classical one. So here, the initial design is very naive something you can do in 2D, but you cannot do in higher dimensions most of the time. Uh, we take this uh, full factorial design with nine points, the blue triangles. Then we have the predictor, which is called the Kriging mean. Uh, and we look at the Kriging variance. This is the prediction variance and the expected improvement criterion. So the expected improvement criterion, I will define it properly. Really, we will take the time to, to understand exactly what it means. But for the moment, let's kind of intuitively uh, see what it means. So you have this mean here, and what you want is to minimize this function, okay? So the, the most simple, the most naive idea that you could have, say, okay, I have a mean, I want to minimize this function, I don't know this function, I have this mean, let's minimize this mean. <coughs> Will be idea at order zero. Then you can say, okay, uh, the problem is that there is a misspecification. This function is not actually the objective function. So if I take the minimum of that one, I may, it may be misleading. But actually, I've got the variance. The variance tells me, well, you, 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 this approximation is very good in some regions, and maybe it's not that good in some other regions. So let's do a trade-off between having a lower value on the mean and a high value on the variance. Because what you want to do is, is to, to find promising regions, but at the same time, you want to explore the space. So the expected improvement is, in some, in, is one way of doing that. And here, it tells you to, to sample at that location, the red point, okay, which is approximately here. And if you add that location and do the loop that we mentioned, then you see that the expected improvement becomes zero here because there is no variance anymore. And you refine the knowledge of the function in this region with this point. <coughs> okay? And then if you do it iteratively, Second. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because it's an, an isotropic kernel yeah. that we put, and the parameters, the thetas, yeah, are not so well estimated. So you have a very strong anisotropy in favor of one direction. <coughs> okay, so then you do that again, and you, you get this new point. We are very lucky. Okay, this initial design is exceptionally good for this example. Uh, then we explore this region. The creaking variance becomes small and Haha, ha, let's go to this other region. You want to explore more. And this other region turns out to be another basin of uh, local optimum. And then if you continue like that with a little animation, well, you will explore the space. And you will especially reinforce your knowledge of the function in the region of interest, which is exactly what you want to do. So this example works, as I said, pretty well. Uh, this is not always like that. That depends a lot on many things, on the initial design, on the function, on the adequacy of your GP model with respect to the properties of the functions, and so on. This is more a didactic example. So a few remarks. First, we have a Gaussian random field model, GP, with some unknown constant mean. So there, it's not universal Kriging, but it's more ordinary Kriging. So it's a very uh, naive model on the mean. And here we have a Matern. Well, actually, I don't remember if it was a Matern or a Gaussian on this example. So we have a Matern covariance kernel, the Gaussian being a limit case of the Matern where when the regularity tends to infinity. The initial point, we're following a full factorial design, sampling criteria is expected improvement, and we estimated uh, the covariance parameters by maximum likelihood. So there is no Bayesian 
uh, treatment of the parameters. So what we will do now uh, in the rest of this talk is to discuss these different hypotheses and how we can adapt the method when we depart uh, from one of these assumptions or how we can cope with some uh, uh, situations that can arise. So I will very briefly review uh, the GP stuff as most of you are already experts now uh, just to fix the ideas and the notations and then I will, we will spend some time on the EI. So what is a random field? What is a Gaussian random field? Well, it's uh, a collection of random variables such that if you take any finite uh, dimensional distribution extracted from this uh, process, you get a Gaussian vector. It is completely characterized by a mean, which we, which we call mu of x, and a kernel we call k of x, x prime. And of course, you can take anything as a, as a mean, a priori, and k is constrained and needs to be symmetric positive definite in the uh, wide sense. Some examples, here you have Matern kernel uh, with a trend which is a polynomial, and you see that you, here the trend is in dotted line, and you have different realization of the underlying GRF model. Then if we go back to our example in uh, 2D, you can do some simulations of a Gaussian random field in 2D. These are kind of the prior functions that you uh, think uh, represent reasonably the, f the unknown function f. And once you have acqui uh, acquired some data, then you evaluate f as of the initial design we mentioned already, and then you will condition the random field based on this data. So once you have chosen some parametric or, non -par or simple form for mu and k, you can also use the information given by the observations to estimate the parameters by maximum likelihood or also to use to appeal to full Bayesian. So here we have nine points. We estimate the parameters and we get, uh, this is the, the mean and this is the variance that we get with uh, the objective function we reviewed earlier by using uh, a Matern kernel and maximum likelihood. So I already displayed this slide yesterday and I will insist again on it because it will be really important to have that in mind for what follows. Once you have your points and you have fitted your parameters, then the GP model gives you a ways of simulating, well, this is also what Matt uh, evocated this morning, uh, the, the GP conditional on the data. So you can do that exactly if you are at a grid or you can also do that in many ways by truncations, spectral methods, uh, if you want to have something continuous, in which case you lose ex the exactness. Okay, so now we come to the very object of, uh, of the talk, which is the expected improvement. So assume, assume that you have modeled, uh, that you have already evaluated the function f at some points, at some endpoints and that you want to evaluate it at new points. Okay, so let's sketch it. So you have the function f like this. You know it at, some, at a couple of points, and then you have some credits. And you want to put one more point where you will evaluate the function f, or maybe more, which we call q. And what we want to do is an optimal way of choosing the q new points. So what you can say, if you want to do minimization, you can say, OK, at time t, I've got a current minimum, which I will denote by Tn. Tn, which is here, T3, OK, because I have three points, is the best value of the response I have so far. And then I can say, OK, actually, there is a real minimum. I need some other colors. Um, the real minimum, of course, is lower than Tn, has to be lower than Tn, and this is F star. And you can say, well, Tn minus F star quantifies in some way uh, the progress I, I can still make. Okay? So what I want to do is to add a point in such a way that the new Tn 
and especially the new Tn plus 1 minus, uh, so Tn plus 1 minus F star will be as small as possible. Okay? So I want to add a point. So if I add a point here, then this quantity will become zero, and I will win. If I add the point somewhere there, for instance, then I will reduce uh, this quantity with respect to that one. But the problem is that I don't know in advance what is the response at the new point. Okay, So I want to make a guess, some educated guess, on what is the point where this quantity will become the smallest. And this is where the GP is helping. Okay, so we wish to minimize, here we are directly in the batch sequential settings. We want to add Q points and we want that the T at after N plus Q points is as close as possible to F star. Two problems arise. First, T N plus Q, well, typically you need to wait until you know the function at these new points in order to know it. And <laughs> there is a second problem is that F star is not known. You don't know it. So you're completely in the dark. You want to add points in such a way that the response that you don't know will be as close as possible to the minimum which you don't know. Okay? So what we do, and what, what has been done for decades by people who have developed the utility theory and so on, is to take an expectation. We say, OK, we have a Gaussian process distribution. So we can define Z star, which would be the equivalent of F star under the GP assumption. And we can define Tn plus Q, which would be the equivalent of Tn plus Q uh, lowercase for the GP. And we can say, I want to add the points N plus 1, N plus Q in order to minimize this quantity in expectation. Okay? And this is exactly what the expected improvement is doing. <coughs> so another thing which is really cool is, is that if you write down this expectation here, you see that Z star, which is the very complicated thing to approximate, doesn't depend on the new point. So you can say, OK, uh, if it doesn't depend on the new point, then I can just forget about Z star, because I can develop by linearity my expectation. Okay? So it's equivalent to, to, to minimize the expectation of T n plus Q, okay? just getting rid of some shift. Or it's also equivalent to minimize Tn plus Q minus Tn, the expectation. And this is exactly what we call the improvement. This is what you have improved between the n plus Q <coughs> iteration and the nth iteration. OK, so Tn plus Tn minus Tn plus Q is the positive part of Tn minus the minimum of the new observations. This is something very simple you can check. OK, this guy. You have to be careful because what is in the parentheses can be negative. And this guy here cannot be negative. It can be zero at, uh, at, at most, at least. At least zero. So this is the positive part of the target at time n minus the minimum brought by the new observations. And then if you take the expectation of that guy, you get the minimum, the expected regret in expectation, which is what we call the expected improvement. And here we have directly derived or try to, to present and understand what is called the Q-point expected improvement. So what is, in expectation, the improvement that a batch of Q-point will bring me after evaluation? So if you set Q is equal to 1, you get the classical expected improvement. And for the classical expected improvement, the very good news is that you have a formula. So this guy that tells you what is brought by one point actually can be written down as an analytic analytical formula that depends only on Tn, which is known, the mean, Kriging mean or GP prediction, and the GP standard deviation, basically. So this is analytical formula that depends on these quantities. That's it. And if you're lucky, if your kernel is sufficiently smooth, then everybody is differentiable. So you can take the gradient, and you can apply efficient method to optimize this guy. So if you want to add one point, and you have one point left in your credit, then the best thing you can do in expectation is to maximize that guy. A few properties. EI is non-negative over D. By construction, it's the expectation of something non-negative. 
it vanishes at the design because we have done deterministic evaluations. So we know exactly the function where we have evaluated it. Generally, unfortunately, EI is really difficult to optimize because it's not convex, not concave, not it's multimodal. But it can be regular, it can be smooth, which is a nice uh, counterpart. And more than that, you can show the following results, which, which has been published in 2010 by Vasquez and Becht. If the kernel possesses some property, which is called the no empty ball property, maybe we can come back to it later if we have time, sampling using expected improvement will fill the space eventually, provided that your function f lives in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space associated with k. So, which is kind of strong assumption, but if your function is smooth, smooth enough, and your kernel is not too smooth, <laughs> then it will converge. It will fill the space. If your kernel is Gaussian, then it doesn't work. You can find counterexamples. There uh, have been one publication in Jogo with a, ca a constructive counterexample on uh, the EI not working with a Gaussian kernel. But with a Matern kernel, it's fine. I mean, in this setup for the reproducing kernel hypothesis. Then, um, of course, after the construction we have done, uh, we can straightforwardly extend it to batch sequential strategies, assuming that you have Q, Q com computers in parallel in a synchronous calculation framework. Then you can say, I'm going to try to find the Q points at the same time, which maximize this, this function. And then I'm going to distribute the calculation of the Q point over Q CPUs. Okay? But the good news we had for Q is equal to 1 is not, is not anymore uh, valid in the sense that this guy is, to, to the best of my knowledge, not simply analytically tractable. You have some ways of calculating it, but it's, it's kind of heavy. So we have discussed that in a paper in 2010. This is also something I had worked on in my PhD thesis beforehand. And recently, relatively recently, a couple of years ago, uh, Clément Chevalier uh, and I, we worked on that. And Clément really had this idea of uh, applying some new formulae, was excited about, and so in another talk. And, and, and we ended up calculating uh, uh, some analytical formula for the expected improvement with Q points. So you see it's not, not that simple. But it works. It works. Uh, the only drawback is that it's relying on a multidimensional CDF of the Gaussian distribution, which are heavy to evaluate and rely on algorithms themselves. Uh, so up to about 10 points, 20 points, there are still some very fast algorithms available for a very large number of points. Uh, it, it's heavy. But in any case, GP methods are not really the kind of methods you want to apply with hundreds and thousands of processors in parallel as of now, because in the GP workshop, in the, yeah, in the GP workshop, we realize also that now there are some methods that deal with that. So maybe we will need some more parallelization for the future. And um, so here is a little example. <coughs> yes. Uh, on the Rastrigin function, uh, which, uh, as you can see, is pretty difficult to optimize because it has a lot of locals. So we, we, we took uh, some, some starting design and then added batches of six, six by six. So this is the, the first batch approximately uh, six point EI uh, optimal batch that you add. And then you have a second one, which is now in red. I like this one because it's, it's spread out, it's uh, exploratory. You see that it tries to avoid the cross correlations between the points. Third batch. And if you continue like that batch sequentially, then yeah you eventually explore uh, the global optimum. Right. 
that was it. So very recently, uh, we, we co-supervised the master student on uh, calculating the gradient of the Q-point expected improvement. Sébastien Marmin, so he, he defended his uh, master thesis in 2014. And we recently, uh, I mean, he recently presented his work in a conference uh, this summer. Uh, there is also an archive paper on that. And we are now doing some, I mean, he has also implemented everything in Dysop team. And we are now doing some massive uh, benchmarking of the properties. So the goal being to navigate in the space of Q-point batches and to use at the same time the formula for the Q-point expected improvement, <coughs> the gradient, to do some kind of multi-start gradient approach on this function. Okay. So now I will review a couple of uh, further results. How much time left? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> no question? Okay, you can stop me if you have questions. Um, now we'll speak about something uh, related to noisy optimization. So I think this is answering a couple of questions that came up uh, during the workshop. And this is something we have been working ab about uh, mostly with Victor Pichny. I think I need to cut that and also my emails because it might be dangerous. Yes. So this is uh, an application which is inspired by a nuclear safety uh, problem where the function f is still deterministic but is evaluated in noise because it's the solution of a PD and the PD is approximated using Monte Carlo methods, so that instead of having f of xi at the design points, you have f tilde, which is a, a, a Gaussian corrupted version of f of xi. You know that I don't denote it by f tilde of xi, but f tilde i, because it's not deterministic, so you can have several observations at the same point within the sequence of observations, okay? And a particularity of this application is that the noise is centered, but we are in a framework where the Monte Carlo simulator was controllable in the sense that you could tune the number of particles of your Monte Carlo depending on the, on the design and say, OK, here I want to spend more time drawing uh, particles at random and having less variance. Or in this region, I want to do first kind of exploratory analysis where I do a very noisy sample. And then I want to add some computational credits uh, on the way. So the covariance matrix of the noise it could be non-diagonal, but here it's diagonal in the sense that the Monte Carlo fluctuations are not, depending, not dependent from one place to the other. But the variances may be heterogeneous. And the central questions that we tackled are where first, and this is something we did quite a long time ago and then we realized that it had been done by, by other people uh, in the GP community, is whether G uh, GRF or GP modeling is still possible in the framework of heterogeneously noisy observation. And I, I think Javier uh, spontaneously answered the question of somebody on Monday, which was about this. So, and, and, and then the other question, which was slightly more technical, is how to adapt expected improvement in this case. And, uh, you will see it's, it's kind of tricky. So what does it mean to do Kriging or GP with heterogeneous noise? Y imagine that you have your simulator that gives you some results of that kind. Okay? So you have a deterministic function behind, which is black. But what you get in the end, what you observe, are these blue stars. And with the blue stars, you have some some confidence given by the Monte Carlo variance. Okay? And for some notation here, previously um, I would have denoted a n as the set of deterministic observations. Here we have a n tilde, which is the event that I know my function at the design point with some noise on top. 
I don't know what is the function value and what is the noise. I know what is the sum of the two. Actually, it turned out uh, that creaking with heterogeneous noise variance is doing, it's doable, and it's not complicated. You just have to add the, the covariance matrix of the noise to your covariance matrix, be it diagonal or not, uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous. doesn't change anything. You can just add this covariance matrix to the covariance matrix of your process, and then you can construct this new mean, which is not interpolating anymore, of course. Um, and <coughs> so the variance is not vanishing at the, uh, at the points. And this is something really important for optimization because in EI, a feature that you like is that the points which you have explored have a zero variance. So you never explore them again. While here, you might be interested in coming back to a simulation point and reinforcing the Monte Carlo in order to reduce the variance. Okay. So what is wrong with the expected improvement in that case? Let's write down the formula of the expected improvement and try to understand why it's not a good idea to apply it without more thinking. So expected improvement is the expectation of the positive part of the minimum at the design, which is my Tn of earlier, minus the next value, which, which I would observe if I, if I did an evaluation at x. And now it is knowing the noisy observations. So the two big problems are the following. First, Tn, which is the minimum of the real function at the endpoints, is not, not known because you have observed it in a, noise, in a noisy setting. So you don't know what, what is the, the blue line. You don't know it. You could take the minimum of the noisy observations, but it would make no sense because it would, it, it would be sufficient to have one very noisy observation so that this minimum would, would be simply be uncontrollable. So you don't want to take it. You could take the minimum of the mean. It would be one option which has been explored. But here we want to look at it in a very constructive way, try to mimic all the decision theoretic thing. The second problem is that if you're doing a noisy evaluation of your function at the next point, in the end, you will not have uh, kind of the revised version of the blue line because you will still have noise on the new observation. So you're comparing two noisy things. And it's not, it's not nice, OK? So unless the, the noise variance at the next iteration is 0, um, it's really difficult to come up with, an, uh, with a formula for that. Actually, it, it's possible, but it's, it's really complicated. So the question we tackled with Victor uh, and some colleagues from Nuclear Safety Institute was how to build a variant of EI that depends on the computational effort that you, that you will put at the new point. Okay. So you want to have something with, that takes the noise into account, and that also depends on how much you can put on a point because you, you, can, you can feel you will not have the same strategy if you have a lot of credit to invest or if you have just a little bit of credit to invest. So imagine, to illustrate what I was just saying, uh, here you have a Kriging before, and here I have added a point there, which is noisy, and I have a new Kriging. So you, you have the before and after uh, setting. What, what does, how can you define improvement, the notion of improvement? How can you come up with one number that tells you to what extent this is improved over that? This is a question to you. What can you do? Yes? No, you. <laughs> Mark. You're a bit more confident about the, the mean or the minimum. So try to express that. Yes. OK. So, I mean, you, re you reduce the uncertainty of the, you know, at the, at the observation. You're much more confident about the mean. Well, I mean, not about the mean function. But I actually can actually compute the, uh, the expected Yes, yes. So this is, this is an idea. You could say, I will define my improvement as the difference between the mean 
at time t, at uh, time n, and the mean at time n plus 1. There you have, two, you have one more issue. Do you take the mean at the design points, or do you take the mean over the whole space to compare it? So this is one possible approach. So we, we took an approach which is very similar to what you're saying, but a slightly more general. We took quantiles. One, the mean in the Gaussian case is the median, so it's one particular case of a quantile. So I think we, we agree. So the idea was, was to say, OK, I want, I, I'm taking a Kriging quantile, and I define the improvement to be the improvement at the design points with respect to some given beta quantile. In the sense that we try to, to think, if I'm an engineer and I have a noisy setup, I want to come up with a solution which has a good probability of being good. So I want, in some sense, to improve not the worst case, but something pessimistic to make sure that what I have in the end is good with high probability. This was the, the, the rationale. So the Kriging, the, the quantile in, in, in our setup, thanks to the Gaussianity, can be written down as a simple combination of the mean and the standard deviation. So finally, we will choose the point among the design points because we think that you would not accept a solution which has never been calculated. So we consider only those points where we have done a calculation before or envisage a calculation. Now, some results which are interesting. If you consider Xn plus 1 to be the candidate points, and if you look at the noisy point, uh, the noisy response that you will get if you evaluate the function at Xn plus 1, and you denote it by Zn plus 1 tilde, then uh, the, the, if you denote by mn plus 1 with a capital M the expectation of the random field of the <coughs> GP knowing your noisy observation and your future noisy observation and Sn square the variance of this GP knowing the noisy past and future observations then you can write down the process Qn plus 1 which is the quantile of the future what will be the quantile at any point x, assuming I, I, I'm adding a, a point at xn plus 1? OK, so we will somehow translate the debate from z to q. And here we will look at the distribution of the future q. And the key result, uh, which I find really cool, I mean, now we got used to that, but at the beginning we were, we were really enthusiastic about that, is that the, the, Kriging, the, the Kriging quantile of the future is a GP. It's a GP which mean is given by that, that's easy to see, and the covariant is slightly more difficult to calculate, depending on Kriging weights and stuff. So once you have said that, then you can apply the expected improvement to this process which is basically what we have done. We have defined the expected quantile improvement as the past minimum minus the value of the quantile at the next step, knowing the noisy observations. And deriving it was just applying the classical formula for the expected improvement with the good mean and variances. But now we have that the variance does depend on the credit, on the computational credit that you invest at the point. OK, so this is the formula, and then we have applied that. So this is the result. I don't go into the detail, uh, because I will give you some references. But you have to imagine that this is a very, uh, I mean, this is the noise here for the representation is already lowered a lot, because this is relying on Monte Carlo. This is raw data. So we have plenty, uh, very fine grids of computer simulations to, to, to make this plot. And here, the, this, this uh, squares were done with some kind of space filling design of extremely noisy observations. This is to have a first picture of what the response surface looks like. And then we have used the expected quantile improvement inside of a loop in order to allocate more or less credits to new points. And what you see here are the credit allocations 
to the next iterates. And so at the beginning, the algorithm is a bit, uh, yeah, uh, is a bit uh, shy and doesn't want to invest too much. And after a while, he understands that there is a really interesting region. And then he invests a lot of Monte Carlo credits and identifies the minimum. Again, this example works well. There are settings where it doesn't work that well. Uh, especially in the paper, uh, we, have, we have analyzed this a little bit more in detail. But we found that this setting uh, was, 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 uh, was interesting and probably there are some more contributions that ca can be done in this uh, sequential allocation of resource for noisy, for optimization in a noisy setting. So we are, we are not the first people to tackle this problem. There was at least uh, in 2006, this paper by uh, Huang et al. was uh, done some, some variant of EI as well. There is the excellent work of uh, Scott Frazier and Powell. And generally, Frazier had, has a lot of very interesting contributions uh, to, to this topic with also other names for the algorithms and, I mean, it's a, slightly different setup, but the ideas uh, are, are quite similar. This is the paper that we published in 2013 in Technometrics. And then uh, together with Victor, we have released a paper, a tutorial paper about the noisy optimization functions of the dice opt package. So now I will tackle a different topic, but you already somehow have a glimpse. We evocated it uh, briefly at the beginning. I told you that EI was optimal if you have one credit, one iteration left. And it turns out that if you do the, the kind of decision theoretic analysis while assuming that you have R, where R is larger than one, uh, evaluations left, then you can do much better than EI. Much better, it's not so sure, but you can do better for sure. So EI is allocating your evaluation assuming it's the last one. Now, if you assume that you have more than one evaluation left, taking, for instance, the case where you have two evaluation left, then what you're interested in is the difference between T at the starting design minus the best response given by the new observation and given by the next, op the next uh, observation. I will do two evaluations n sequentially. I know that the expected improvement, I know what should be the expected improvement, the one shot expected improvement of the next, of one X. But it's not exactly what I want. But now I know that in one step in the future, the optimal strategy will be to optimize the expected improvement. So I can already anticipate that I will have an X2 star, which is a, in capital letter, which is a random location that will depend on the response I will have after one iteration. So the optimal strategy turns out to be to maximize this guy, but it's extremely complicated to calculate because you need to, you need to understand what the distribution of this maximizer will be in the future, which you can simulate, but it's hard. So this is what the optimal strategy looks like. So actually, this construction was already more or less uh, understood in, in, in MOCUS uh, in 82, maybe earlier. Uh, independently, I think, it has, been, uh, it has been considered and established by Michael and his team. Uh, we also have a paper with Rodolphe Lurich uh, on the topic of the optimal finite time strategy. And there is this really nice uh, theoretical paper on uh, regret bounds for Gaussian process bounded problems uh, with some more detail at the end of the slideshow, if you're interested, where they consider this strategy. 
Okay, now I'm zapping a little bit. 30 minutes, super. And I will speak a bit about what uh, Nando and, and collaborators have been doing uh, recently about very high dimensional Bayesian optimization. I, I will just touch the subject uh, because all these methods, I mean, you see the, the theoretical setup is quite neat, but you need to know the kernel. You need to have, you need the Gaussian uh, assumption to make sense. And in practice, you're limited by the number of points. You're limited by the number of dimensions. And you're limited by the maximization of the acquisition function. There are many things that limit you. That makes this kind of method good in some sense for less than 1,000 iterations. Uh, dimension, moderate dimensions, up to 10 or so, a little bit more sometimes, but not like hundreds. But recently, there has been an attempt to go for very high dimensions. And what is completely crazy is that this attempt is successful. So not only one attempt, actually. So what can you do if is D is very large, if your number of dimensions is very large? For those who have attended the, talks of, uh, the talk of Nicolas, you might think, okay, then you can use additive models, for instance. Okay. So this is one option. Then you can say, okay, I will kind of incorporate some, some structural assumption, simplifying assumption, uh, to make the problem less complicated. Here we will review something different. Uh, you can assume that something different or slightly differently formulated, you can assume that the function may, might have hundreds or thousands or millions of parameters, but maybe there are only a small number of them which are influential. But then you don't, you don't know which ones. If you knew which ones, you would just optimize with respect to them. But if you don't know which ones, you have two kind of meta ideas. One is to try to identify them, to do some kind of sensitivity analysis, to say, OK, I will do some statistical uh, evaluations, I mean, some, some planning, and then with a sample, I will be able to distinguish which are the important variables and so on, and then I will do a, a model with restricted number of variables. But the other idea is to say, I'm going to take a, a, a small number of directions in space randomly, and I'm going to do my optimization with respect to these random directions. OK? Would it work? Probably. So I invite you really to have a look not only at this paper, but especially at this paper on Bayesian optimization and a billion dimensions via random embeddings. Uh, at the moment, there is also a PhD student uh, under the co-supervision of Olivier Roustan, myself, and people at Renault, uh, who is working on that. So the idea, basically, is that you will choose some random directions, and then you will do the Bayesian optimization in, in, with, with respect to the, to the co corresponding coordinates. And surprisingly, it works quite well on, on, on a number of test cases. There is also the work by uh, Chen Castro and Krause um, in a different setting. Some paper on high-dimensional Gaussian process bandits. And so this is the, the work I was mentioning. Uh, we recently, I mean, Mikhail recently presented at uh, Lion 9 on a, a, a novel kernel uh, which is adapted to this, to this strategy. Now, coming to the large number of points, um, I realized this week that there have been a number of people in the GP community who have been doing excellent work on the topic. So it's, it's completely. Uh, subjective state of the art. I'm just citing two references. Uh, actually, I just Googled this morning Bayesian optimization plus sparse Gaussian process or plus uh, big data. Or, well, I don't remember exactly what I was typing, but I typed some qu quite obvious combination of keywords and there were not so many papers that came out. Not so many. So it seems that it's, it's just at, the, at, it, at its infancy. So there is this paper that Nando mentioned yesterday uh, where they depart from the GP framework and they, they, they take some, some deep neural network and, and, and can do a Bayesian optimization with very, very large number of points. You see my enthusiasm is making me getting rid of my microphone. And 
also with uh, Tipa Lucretia Kearney, who have recently done an attempt uh, with some, some uh, very interesting results, promising results on using SPGP, so sparse Gaussian process, and expected improvement together. So basically what we do is we fit an SPGP, and then we have some strategy to locate regions of the space which are interesting, thanks to the SPGP, creating local Kriging models, GP models, calculating the expected improvement, and then choosing which one of the area I will visit next. So th I think this is also related to the work of Mark to some extent, which is not yet published. So there is something going on in Mark's direction. We need to talk. <laughs> Um, finally, this is something that came up also in discussions uh, because the model that uh, we are making a big bet, a big bet in, opti in Bayesian optimization when, when we say the function f is a realization of a Gaussian process because we don't know it. This is a prior. So there is this and then there is the parameter estimation problem. <coughs> if you don't estimate the parameters well, then w everything you're going to do is suspicious, it's questionable. So there have been a number of attempts to extend BO and expected improvement. One way is to make it full Bayesian. Say, I'm going to put a prior, some hyper uh, parameter prior on the covariance parameters. And another approach was to appeal to parametric bootstrap. Okay. So just to review a couple of references uh, in which calculating EI was reported to favor exploratory behaviors um, we did a, a fir some, some attempt where we mixed exponential and Gaussian kernel and tried to see on the, on the live which one would, would succeed when adding points by expected improvement under a mixture. Uh, I think that Bobby Gramassi and his team, uh, so Gramassi and Taddy and then Gramassi and, and, and other people from his team have uh, done quite a lot in... Uh, especially in sequential Monte Carlo and, and, and related techniques. There is also this, this uh, very nice contribution by Benassi, Beck, and Vasquez in 12 about Bayesian optimization using sequential Monte Carlo. And uh, Kleinen and co-authors have uh, done some work on bootstrapping the covariance parameters for expected improvements. So to finish with, a few other topics that, that we did not have time to cover. Uh, multi-objective Bayesian optimization is a very active field. So here you need to type multi-objective expected improvement, for instance, because BO mm, terminology is not exactly the same, multitask. Or, but people have worked on calculating multi-objective EI for a long time uh, in, in Holland, in Germany, in, uh, in France. Uh, constraint Bayesian optimization is also a very active field. Uh, robust, multi-fidelity, it's very lively at the moment, and also I, I was thinking of acquisition functions for other topics where you don't necessarily want to find the maximum or the minimum, but you might want to find a region. So this is what I refer to as Bayesian set estimation uh, using Gaussian random field models. Thank you very much. Yes? Maybe we have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, we have just tons, of time. Time. tons of time. Yeah. Tons of questions. Yes. Do you know how ARD handles dimensions? Well, implicitly, when I'm saying anisotropic, it means ARD. So, yeah, in typical applications, we use this theta that depends on the dimension. I think the main issue is the multiplicative form or the kind of, kind of the Euclidean or slightly related to Euclidean norm that you're using in, in standard kernels, which when the dimension goes large is, yeah, it becomes hopeless to explore it with this metric. So n then you need to have adapted metric that makes your kind of efficient dimension small. 
and this is not what ARD, I mean, I don't think ARD can, can go, it's better than isotropic if you, are, if you suspect there are anisotropies, but I'm not sure it, it can do that job of, of really completely mitigating the curse of dimensionality. Yes. Yes? Is there a question? Yes. <laughs> As how we do that? Because I, I did not actually, I did not exactly explain how it worked. Um, so actually there is an algorithm, you can find it in, in the annex appendices of the slideshow that works more or less like that. So basically we, we add a little bit of credit and then regularly we check outside of the current point if there is a point which has a higher expected improvement. If not, we continue investing credit on that point, and if yes, then we switch. So this is how it works. It's not optimal yet, but this is practical. Do what we did. More questions? Yes. Yeah, no empty ball. Yeah. So no empty ball property is quite nice. You can also find it in the appendices. So the no empty ball property tells you, I mean, for a kernel K to have the no empty ball property, you need to have the equivalence between the fact that a point is adherent in a topological sense to a sequence of points, if and only if the variance at that point is uh, tending to zero. And it might be a little bit trivial, but it's not. So you can find kernels like the Gaussian kernel where the variance can tend to zero even though you don't have any observation in the ball around by regularity because the kernel is so regular that you can learn all the derivatives outside and then your Taylor expansion will tell you exactly what the value inside of the ball is. And this is not good because it means that you might get trapped and never explore this ball. And so it's not good for global optimization. This is the message. This is what is proven in the paper by Becht and Vasquez where they introduce this hypothesis. Maybe one last question.